In the last 30 days, we've done $220,000 in video game sales on Amazon and are expecting to hit a million by the end of the year out of this basement with one employee. And as glamorous as this basement is now, it didn't start out like this. It actually started five years ago. I had 500 bucks to my name with a bad job in a tiny apartment. And in this video, I wanna take you guys with me along through that journey and share with you all of the changes I made along the way to go from that to this. I actually started my resale business only on a part-time basis. My wife was in law school and I was working full-time at my friend's collectible coin company. And I was just looking for a way to earn some extra money on the side because we were living in a small apartment, not making a ton. And I stumbled upon a couple of these guys, actually these exact guys, Gary V and Cincinnati Picker. And my mind was blown because they were going out to yard sales and finding things for super cheap and then flipping them oftentimes very quickly on eBay. And I said to myself, man, that seems like a really fun and potentially low risk way to build up some extra income. The only problem was I didn't really have much money to start. So I cobbled together 500 bucks of like birthday and Christmas money. And I promised Erica that that would be the only 500 I spent on the business. Anything that I wanted to invest in inventory or supplies or anything would have to come from flip profits from that initial 500. And so I hopped in my Prius and started spending every Saturday going to yard sales and estate sales and book sales, anywhere that I could spend very little money and hopefully find stuff to flip. At this point, it was pre YouTube channel, but I do have some old Instagram stories that I was using to document the process. I remember my first flip ever was from a Goodwill. I found this big wooden sign for five bucks and flipped it on Facebook Marketplace the next day for 40. And I would have sworn I was the richest man in the world. From that point on, I was absolutely hooked. Spent $311 out the door here. And uh, I think it should be at least 450 in profit. And it didn't come a moment too soon because that's where things actually took a bit of a darker turn. Now I mentioned that at this point, I was just doing it part-time as a little side hustle. I definitely had secret dreams of eventually doing this full-time, but at that point I definitely was not ready. I wasn't at that level, which definitely made it sting when after a few months of struggling at my full-time job at my friend's coin business, I got fired. Now, we still had to keep our bills paid while Erica was in school, so I got a job that paid way less at a coffee shop. Um, and after a couple weeks of that, my friends came back and said, hey, we have this other position, we can maybe try retraining you and we can at least pay better than this. Uh, so I tried that and for a few months just could not hack it and ended up getting fired for a second time from the same job. Now, the first time getting fired from that job was tough. I consider myself a generally capable and competent person, so the fact that I just kept making mistakes at this place, just, it didn't sit well with me. But the second time I got fired, it wrecked me. Here I was, uh, two years into a young marriage, my only responsibility was to make sure that we had food on the table all the time, and my only responsibility was to make sure that we had food on the table until Erica graduated. And here I was not even able to hold down a job. My first time I got fired, I knew that it was a big failure. But the second time, I knew that I was. Now, at this point, the flipping side hustle was doing well, but I had only made enough to theoretically replace my income for a couple of months. I wanted much more of a track record than that but Erica encouraged me to just try doing it full time. So I named the business Phoenix Resale out of a hope that out of the ashes of my failed career that maybe something beautiful could be born. I got my substitute teaching license just as a backup in case I needed to fill some gaps and only used it twice. Now, in that first year of flipping, I was focused very much on low cost, high margin products. It's why I flipped so many books. I ended up buying a bunch of textbooks from Erica's law school friends, uh, went to a bunch of book sales and estate sales, and I dabbled in all kinds of cheap items. And through sheer force of will, I was able to, in 2019, in this first year, sell $40,000 of random miscellaneous product on eBay and sell 88K 
in primarily books on Amazon. Was able to do this despite a relatively modest budget because my buy cost was so low on stuff. That left me with a total gross proceeds of $128,000 in my first year of mostly part-time reselling. And that was mostly due to just a whole lot of late nights and not taking any weekends off. The best part was my net margins were pretty good this year. My best year to date because my buy costs were so low. I still was reinvesting a lot, but I ended up netting about 45K that first year. Meaning that my overall margins for 2019 were a really solid 35%. Now, at first glance, because our whole graph is a million dollars here, this doesn't look all that impressive, but keep in mind, this was over 100,000 in sales. I felt really good about it. And that 45K made a huge difference, mostly because the first big lesson that I learned from my first year of reselling is to reinvest profits. Now, all of you guys are probably saying, Caleb, that's incredibly basic. That's a terrible lesson. And it is. Keep in mind, I had no idea what I was doing. And I quickly realized that the more I took the money I was making and immediately splurged it all on Chipotle burrito bowls, the less money I would have left over to put into things that would make my business better, like a ton of packing tape or like a Dymo label printer, absolutely huge. Uh, an Amazon listing software, a barcode scanner, things that would actually make me more efficient and effective in the long run. So that's a huge recommendation that I have for people who are also just starting out their resale businesses. The second lesson is to down widely. This first year, I realized that I really like selling books and video games and hats, but I really hate selling like clothing and large electronics and makeup. Uh, so I was able to understand by dabbling widely the kinds of niches that were more and less worth it for me to go deeper into doing all of this at a very low cost, mostly through yard sales. And then the last one on a more personal note is that sucking once is not the same as sucking at everything, right? Absolutely failed miserably at my first job and it, my identity really took a hit if I'm being honest, but I kind of learned through reselling that the fact that you suck at one thing doesn't mean that you're going to suck at a lot of it, you know, life in general. Uh, so if you guys are in that mental place, just wanted to share that little learning with you as well. Yep, just a little lesson on suckage. Now folks, 2020 was really my first year of not only full-time selling, but also niching down on video games because I had realized the previous fall that they were pretty readily available at my local pawn shops, but most other resellers didn't really touch them a whole lot because I found most of them really like going to yard sales or thrifts or estate sales. So early 2020 consisted of a whole bunch of pawn shop routes. I would usually go to 10 or 15 pawn shops, family videos and video game stores in a given city and specialize in the stuff that I knew would do better for me on Amazon. And this is a process that you can actually watch because this is also exactly the time that I started my YouTube channel. I figured a lot of the reselling content at the time was a little bit samey and I thought if I could even just get like a niche following it would at least help get my name out to other collectors and maybe be able to buy more collections. Recent games were two for 15, which is a pretty good starting price. Picked up a couple of them, uh, Dishonored. Look at this. 25 year old guy here. He doesn't even realize that his hairline is slowly deserting him. So for early 2020, I went on my merry way doing terrible pawn shop pickup and grandma's attic haul videos until you guys all know what happened that spring. Harry and Meghan left the royal family. And I can only assume as a result, video game prices skyrocketed. Now the good news is many pawn shops actually remained open during lockdown because they're technically fine. Come on, dog, <laughs> so lay down. <laughs> because they're technically financial institutions. So I had some really great sourcing opportunities. I would go into these places and buy like 15 Wii's that had been sitting there for 20 years. They would clear them out for like 20 bucks and I would sell them all same week for 150 bucks on Amazon. And once video game stores opened back up, I would go into those and buy a bunch of consoles and games that had spiked, but the prices in store hadn't caught up and be able to sell almost everything same week for hundreds of dollars. Now around this time, I also invented a brand new method of sourcing, which was taking a latest gen console, like a Switch, I had a ton of success with these, posting it for trade on Facebook Marketplace. I would say, hey, I've got this console, I'm looking to trade for retro games, and was just looking for people who had old collections that they didn't want anymore, that were valued at higher than the value of a Switch. Awesome. All looks to be present and accounted for, thank you. Get back and we'll figure out how much it's all worth. 
and this worked out incredible. Since then, I have seen uh, maybe a half a dozen YouTube channels use this method of sourcing, but let the record show there is video evidence. I am the one who invented it, and at the time, no one else was doing it, and I cashed in. I would consistently trade a switch for five, six, seven hundred dollars worth of inventory of people's old retro collections, and they were absolutely thrilled every time because at the time, these were really hard to come by. I'm gonna hold on to this for a while and see what the price does because I'm just kind of curious for my own knowledge. But the experimenting didn't stop there, folks. I also started taking all of my low dollar games or stuff that I knew couldn't move on Amazon and trading it in in bulk to video game stores for the kind of inventory that would do great for me, which is, as you can see, a method that we still use to this very day. All at once take them to a video game store to use as trade-in and swap them out for games that I can sell profitably on Amazon. Now, one strategy that I don't recommend as much these days is I also would go on GameStop.com when they were having a big clearance sale and buy tons and tons of inventory. The reason that I wouldn't recommend it that much is because most of the stuff, I would say around half or 40%, ended up being completely loose without case or manual. And I don't know if it ended up being as profitable as I hoped it would, but that was just another way that I was dabbling in different forms of video game resale to figure out what worked best for me. Now. By the numbers, 2020 was an incredible year. Not only did prices explode for the exact kind of inventory that I was selling, but also my little YouTube channel in the space of this year kind of took off. I ended up with like 30,000 subscribers and 10K views per video. And the best part was the resale business didn't even have to take a hit. I mean, we did $395,000 this time in mostly video games on Amazon, another 65K on eBay for a total of 466,000 and was able to bring our net up from 45,000 the year that I was doing it mostly part-time to $79,000. Now, this doesn't sound like a lot, especially compared to 600, 466,000, but you have to keep in mind, one, I was still learning from my first lesson of the first year and reinvesting my profits. And I was buying things like a second shed to keep inventory in and a fancy editing computer that I could use to scale up the YouTube business. A lot of this revenue did end up getting reinvested in the business. And the second thing is like, you have to remember, for a dude who came from getting fired twice in a row, this number was just an absolutely incredible boost for morale. Now, during this year, I learned two huge lessons. The first one is that winners adapt fast. In early 2020, it was really scary for a lot of people, and it was scary for me too, because a lot of my regular sourcing avenues, especially in the beginning, were shut down. And to a lot of people, I know that was very crippling. But what I realized is, if you can adapt quickly and adjust to a changing market, changing markets present even more opportunity than a stagnant market. And on a very similar note, one man's excuse is another man's opportunity. This was a time where so many people were panicking and complaining on social and Facebook groups and on Instagram of, oh my gosh, like how is my business going to survive? My regular sourcing avenues are shut down. I don't know what I'm going to do. This is terrible. But at the same time, I saw a lot of other resellers just quietly crushing it. And I realized that there's a fundamental difference between how successful and unsuccessful resellers and business owners encounter obstacles. Some of them see excuses and see doom and gloom and what the heck is going to happen and others see opportunity. And the ones that were willing to adapt and pivot and say, okay, now I'm gonna do a bunch more on Facebook Marketplace because stuff is selling for crazy prices. Or I'm gonna tell my friends and family that I really need inventory and I know they're going to help me out because they're probably just bored at home. Or I'm gonna find businesses, retail businesses, that are shutting down as a result of the lockdown and buy all of their inventory at a cheap price. So many resellers were able to quietly crush it in 2020. And as a result of learning this lesson, I was able to eh, not crush it as much as some people did, but definitely see a really solid increase in numbers despite an equal increase in obstacles. Now, 2021 was another excellent growth year and it brought with it multiple new ways to make money flipping video games, like buying large collections, going to video game conventions, and retail arbitrage. My first convention happened in Alabama in June. This was right when public gatherings started to be allowed again. So before this, I really hadn't gotten the chance to attend shows 
And boy, what a show it was. It was actually a small show called Game Jam South, and it really opened my eyes to what a unique opportunity video game conventions were. I made the brilliant choice of hunting, vending, and vlogging all at one time for this one day show, and somehow managed to sell over a thousand bucks worth of stuff, spend a couple thousand more on stuff to flip, and make a killer video out of it at the same time. Yeah, if you guys, if you guys at the end of this, have any need to like clear stuff out, feel free to let me know. I, I'm gonna have a lot more room in my car, so. Although I did learn that day that it's best at conventions to focus on either buying or selling and not both. I probably wouldn't do that and I'd be interested in going to more conventions slash expos uh, in the future just to buy. I went to a couple more shows this year like Southeast Game Exchange and Too Many Games and I realized that a lot of rookie resellers share the same misunderstanding. That at expos and trade shows, there's very little room for profit or deal making because all of the other vendors already know what they have and you're not gonna get any good deals. But in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. One of the most important lessons I learned this year later became a channel mantra, opportunity is everywhere. I realized that I was able to have so much success buying from pawn shops, video game stores, and conventions because so many other people shared the same defeatist assumptions that there was no money to be made and no profitable deals to be struck with other resellers and vendors. I'll go ahead and do the 120. All right, cool. That's not a bad price. The reality is even within the same niche of resale like used video games, everyone has a different business model and the opportunities for mutually beneficial deals are everywhere. In 2021, I leaned even heavier into networking with pawn shops, game stores, and resellers and figuring out how to buy the items that worked best for my unique model and quickly sell off the kinds of games that don't to my new friends so that they could make money Here. too. Okay, how do you think you got cash? Yeah. I can do cash if it helps. Yeah, I do better. Uh, okay. You can how much, 153? Yep. 140? Now folks, this one lesson of opportunity is everywhere, I just realized ingrained itself so deep within my psyche that as I was doing my numbers for the last month, I realized that we spent 100K on inventory, which I'm pretty sure was a personal best. And guess what? 100% of that spending went to other resellers of some kind. We'll get into that more a little bit later, but when I saw that, it just blew my mind. Now, another sourcing avenue that I developed during my second year of full-time reselling is retail arbitrage. This one was not my idea, but I would go into retail stores, usually at Walmart, and find games that were on sale or on clearance that I could still flip on eBay or Amazon. And for some reason, in 2021, Walmart was having all of these secret clearance sales, where at a lot of stores, their clearance was wasn't necessarily marked. So I would go into these places and buy unmarked, unstickered clearance games for $5. Three dollars, a dollar, even three cents. And if you don't believe me, it's all documented. And this is an example of some unmarked clearance. So you can see there's a $42, $43 price on that. But when I actually scan it into my Walmart app, boom, 10 bucks. Look at all these clearance games. This is amazing. Just checking out Walmart number four here and happen to find some unmarked clearance. We've got Everybody's Golf VR on PlayStation for a whopping $1. Let's go. Xenoblade Chronicles marked at $50, unmarked for $10. Let's go, and there's two of them. Oh man, guys, we just scored. Now, since the channel was also growing during this period, I also had several people hit me up to sell collections that were worth several thousand dollars. I could be at like 40 bucks is like 120 fare for the bin. Whoa. Yeah, there's some cool titles in here for sure. Huh, okay, this, it looks, is still sealed. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm guessing this one has some pretty serious value. Looks like this one actually holds some value too, Mr. Driller. Now, the biggest thing that I learned from doing multiple bulk deals in 2021 was a mantra that I call pay your partners. It kind of flips traditional reselling wisdom on its head because normally when you're doing deals, especially bulk deals, you wanna pay as little as possible to maximize profit. But what I started doing was pay paying as much as I reasonably could while still hitting my margins instead of as little as possible and trying to see my competition as collaborators rather than competitors. And that ended up being one of the most important belief systems of my entire reselling career because now most of the people, collectors, vendors, store owners that I do business with end up being repeat transactions rather than one-time deals. And in fact, that philosophy undergirds our entire primary business model now because most of the deals that we're doing involve our buy list, but 
Again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Now, 2021 was also a huge year for the channel because two things happened. The first one was at my second convention ever, I met a struggling YouTuber named Aaron. I told you that. It's pretty handsome That's very too. generous. He, he, yeah, he's... Go on, he's go a, on, please. Keep, keep, you, keep it coming. Nice. Yes, thank you. His are pretty firm, <laughs> yeah. biceps are pretty nice. And he basically begged me to give him some help, so I ended up letting him edit some of my videos on the channel. And for some reason, you guys have still continued to put up to him this day, although a lot of you may just know him as Editor Riff. That's Editor Stiff to you. And now, the other huge thing that happened in 2021 for the channel was the beginning of the GameCube Gambit. It started out really just as a way to show how flipping stuff could help you build a collection, but uh, it caught on pretty much immediately. At the time, no one else was really doing like episodic console-based collecting series. And to this day, when I'll meet people at conventions or out in the wild, Oftentimes what they'll cite is what they introduced me to the channel in the first place is that very collecting series. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was the single greatest GameCube Gambit stop to date. We got eight, eight, eight Ben, eight, <laughs> eight titles that were on the list of 75 games that I want in the collection at the same stop. And yeah. I didn't even meet the whole budget. But folks, enough about the channel and personal achievements. How much money did we actually make in 2021? Well, it was honestly a really solid year overall. We had 371k in gross sales, 299 of that by far the majority was on Amazon and in video games. We also had a miscellaneous 66k on eBay and a little baby 6k right there on whatnot right at the end of the year. Um, we ended up netting 75K on that money. Now you may notice if you're paying attention, uh-oh, we have a little bit of a downward trend right here between 2020 and 2021 uh, from 79 to 75K take home. Uh, and that's primarily for two reasons. One is that we're not getting crazy 2020 prices anymore. A lot of the prices were holding, but the opportunities have gone down slightly as things start to normalize a little bit. And then the other thing is uh, the channel during this year was actually now making an estimable uh, amount of money. That money is not factored in anywhere to this equation because this is mostly about resale businesses. But I'm getting a little bit tired of Hater Hank telling me that I make all my money on YouTube because clearly I don't. It's definitely this year, it's much lower than 75K, but it is still an estimable enough chunk that overall my revenue from 2020, or my profit rather, from 2020 to 2021 did still rise, which is always a good thing. Now folks, as I was going back through some of this old footage in preparation for this video, I realized something that pretty much every year of the resale business, something significant has changed. There hasn't been a single year where like I just kind of coasted and tried to optimize the current systems. Like I've been trying new stuff every single year, which is I think why I'm learning so much along the way. 2022 was no exception. And honestly, it may even be the craziest year to date. Now with all the things that have been changing in the business over the years, the one thing that has stayed most consistent between 19 and 21 is the platforms that we were selling on. You can see it's pretty consistent. Amazon, eBay, Amazon, eBay, Amazon, eBay. But 2022, a lot of you guys will remember, was the year of whatnot. They technically hit the scene in late 2021, but in 2022, you could hardly watch a YouTube video without hearing this video is sponsored by Whatnot. Thanks so much to Whatnot for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you guys there. For our next Whatnot stream tonight, the night this video is posted is our Whatnot giveaway live stream. Now, they may have been the new kids on the block, but they had that venture tech money. And that first year, they went absolutely scorched earth on the YouTube sponsorships. This is no joke, have been using this app called Whatnot, and we're kind of seeing it like explode in like the retro community. Now, this was excellent for Phoenix Resale, not just because we could triple dip and make money on the sponsorship and referrals and inventory sales all at once, but also because it was just a lot of fun. Now, I know at this point, Hater Hank is likely to say, this Phoenix resale had an unfair advantage on whatnot because he just brought his YouTube audience over to sell all his inventory to them. And in response to that, I just want to set the record straight and say that is absolutely right. Ah, yes, finally, I knew it. Ah. <laughs>
It's absolutely a huge advantage to have a pre-existing audience that you can bring into your streams and we definitely use it. From 21 to 22, you can see we went up from 6K in sales to 146K on whatnot in 2022. Now the thing is, Everyone understands that having a pre-existing audience is a huge advantage on whatnot, but I think often underestimated is the advantage that you also have from having the soft skills of a YouTuber on a video-based selling platform. Being able to entertain people and engage an audience and generate hype is an absolutely OP skill when you're doing live auctions. This song's kind of fire. Do you have the VHS here? One of the biggest things that I learned from this period is that different forms of selling can favor different kinds of people depending on what your skill set is. For example, owning a video game store may favor like marketing and management skills. Selling at conventions might favor people with great interpersonal skills. eBay and Amazon tend to be a little bit more insular and analytical. And selling on whatnot definitely favors people who can attract and retain attention. And the biggest recommendation that I would have for you if you are just starting out selling video games is to try as much as possible different forms of selling your inventory. You can buy a booth at a flea market, for example, or try out eBay, Amazon, whatnot, or a convention booth for relatively cheap and low risk. And it can be a huge difference maker in determining what your favorite business model is for moving product long term. So in other words, yes, the skills and resources that I gained from YouTube were an absolute competitive advantage on on whatnot. But as we'll see a little bit later, the biggest competitive advantage the channel has lent me that I've ever found actually came the next year. But getting back to 2022, at this point in the business's development, I pretty much always had more work than I could really handle between eBay, Amazon, whatnot, conventions, bulk deals, game store stuff. And until this point, I had put off hiring as long as I possibly could. One of the fundamental mantras that has led my business is keep it small and keep it all. I really have no ambition at all to scale my business to become a titan like E-Starland or Luki Games or DK Oldies. My personal goal is to do as much profit as I possibly can while keeping overhead as small as possible. People ask me all the time why I haven't opened up a video game store yet. And the reason is it's inconsistent with the philosophy of keep it small and keep it all. I mean, the headaches, the liabilities, the management, and the overall obligations that come with a video game store is just not a path that I really want to go down. That said, in 2022, I knew that the business had reached a point where I could not continue growing without help. And so despite the fact that I've been very resistant to add any additional liability to the business, sometimes that liability is just so handsome that you can't really resist. <laughs> is that sexual harassment to even say that? Now Spanky, as Phoenix Resale's first ever actual part-time employee, what do you remember about that first year? I remember um, tiptoeing around a workout bike and a <laughs> yoga mat. Yeah, I thought I was gonna be a YouTube superstar and my career just never took off. <laughs> now, a huge question that a lot of other resellers and business owners will have is that as you're coming out of the beginning phase of your business, how do you know when it's the right time to hire? As I already said, my general philosophy is to put it off as long as you possibly can. I am not big on hiring before you really need to. I knew that I really needed to ultimately when the inconvenience of not having an employee outweighed the inconvenience of adding one. And with a good employee, if you find the right person through the training process, they go from being an addi <laughs> they go from being an additional headache to actually being your Tylenol. <laughs> is that the most offensive analogy you've ever heard? Really noted. <laughs> Anyways, the point is you should take into careful consideration the cost of hiring an employee, but in general, over time, you should find that they end up costing you less time and energy than they save. And Spanky got to that point pretty quick because there was just way more work than I possibly could do, which means it was probably a good decision. And also, look at the guy. <laughs> And as if all of that change wasn't already enough, who could forget that in 2022, we also switched facilities from a single 
a spare bedroom and a couple of sheds to this lovely half basement. And some of you guys may think, Caleb, that's not actually that big of an upgrade, but let me tell you, when you don't anymore have to trudge through the snow to get to your sheds and access your eBay inventory every day, it makes a huge difference. And while instead of making this jump, we definitely could have gone to something like a warehouse to have more space and be able to hire more employees, at this point, you guys already understand why we didn't go that route. All right, let's get into the juicy, juicy numbers of 2022, shall we? Unsurprisingly, as a result of increased conventions, increased deals, and most importantly, Mr. Advil behind the camera helping me out and being able to move more inventory. 2022 was our best sales year to date. We did 501,000 on Amazon, in addition to the 146 that we already talked about on Whatnot, for a total of 647K in sales, which is fantastic. We netted on that 109K. Now you may ask, you may be paying attention to the profit margin percentages for each year. Caleb, hold on a second. Looks like you had 20% margin in 2021 and 17 in 22. What gives? Isn't that the opposite of the direction that you want to go? And yes, that is the case. This was mostly due. I don't think that our margins on deals really slipped much here. This was mostly due to higher overhead costs of guess what, Mr. Advil payroll. But the other thing that you'll notice is that the increase here in overall revenue outpaced the decrease in overall margin to the point where profit still was able to go up from 75K to 109K. And that's really what you want to see as you're adding people. That's a great signal that the additional cost is well worth it. Now, this year, again, talking about reinvesting profits, most of this or a lot of this did end up going into the down payment for this house because at this point, Erica is working and we're able to live largely off of her salary. Just as a little personal finance note, all to say that if your margins are shrinking, it's okay as long as your bottom line is not doing the same thing. So folks, that all brings us right here to 2023, which spoiler alert has been even better than 2022. But before we get there, I just wanna say, if you like content like this, you may very well enjoy my second channel, Renix P Sale, which is largely dedicated to behind the scenes content of the resale business and me randomly rambling about different business concepts and philosophies that I'm learning. So you may very well accidentally put your price for Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom 3, but only list it as Marvel versus Capcom 3. Uh, check that out. It's definitely way worse than what you're used to seeing on Phoenix Resale, but the plus side is I just edit everything on my phone that is filmed there, so Editor Riff will never rear his ugly head over there, which is a huge plus. Let me just put on my calendar real quick which days I'm gonna be editing for Caleb next year. Oh. There it is. Now, my mantra for 2023 was three words, do less better. This came about because at the end of 2022, I reached a bit of a burnout point and knew that I couldn't keep producing at the level I was if I wanted the quality to stay high. So as a result, one of the things I did was I took the channel upload schedule down from two a week to just one a week. And if you guys have been tracking on the channel recently, we actually went down again in, in uh, November down to just two a month. And even though this does come at the cost of overall revenue, it also allows me the mental time and energy to make sure that every upload is excellent and that the business stays healthy and growing. Now, another way that we implemented this strategy, this is less on the like resale business side and more on the broad picture of Phoenix resale was I'm now doing less sponsorships on the channel. You guys may or may not have noticed. Uh, to be honest, that was the single most profitable part of the business on a like dollars per hour basis. So it stung a little bit to take it away, but ultimately I really just didn't like it. I still don't like just taking an afternoon to script and edit an ad read that ultimately makes a video worse. To be clear, I have nothing against sponsorships at all in general. I'm all for creators getting paid any way that they can, but right now the business has uh, the space and kind of the luxury that I don't really have to. It's possible I'll go back to them in the future, but it ended up being something that freed me up to do less better this year that I think ended up having a really positive impact on our bottom line, which we'll see later. Now, the way that we did execute the do less better philosophy in the resale business was actually twofold. One is we started doing fewer whatnot auctions and we started not taking consoles. Now, it's not because consoles were not profitable, but I knew all along that our real bread and butter in the Amazon business is 
two things, games and handhelds. And every time uh, we got a whole bunch of consoles in, I would procrastinate them, I would put them off, and when we did finally get to them, we didn't have the efficiencies and the systems in place to process them quickly, and our profit per hour was significantly lower than it was for games and handhelds, which we did have the systems for. One of the concepts that uh, I broke down recently on the second channel, Renix P-Sale, is that of addition bias, which is basically our tendency to solve problems by adding things rather than taking things away. And this year is our year of resisting addition bias and taking away parts of the business that aren't fully optimized, such as buying consoles and doing more miscellaneous whatnot streams than necessary in order to pour gas on the things that are working and the results, as we'll see in a little bit, have been really stellar. Now, another huge change that happened this year is I actually hired my first full-time employee. But unfortunately, once they found out that I'm a scammer and a fake gamer, they quickly backed out. So I ended up just promoting Spanky instead. And uh, the timing actually worked out pretty amazing because he had just wrapped up seminary. And as you can see from our numbers from 2021, his even part-time presence made an absolutely huge impact. And at that point, like we were still scaling to the point where like there was enough work to go around. And uh, at this point, he's in charge of all incoming and outgoing inventory and even vetting deals. So if you guys want a good number, if you're trying to sell us your collection, you have to be nice to him. It's true. I'll usually shortchange you. <laughs> now, the deals that I'm talking about that Spanky is vetting now are coming mostly from our new buy list program. This is basically a spreadsheet of all of the games and handhelds that we pay the best for that we've distributed to all of the partners and other resellers and game stores and vendors that I've met over the year at conventions and through the channel. And I teased you guys earlier when I said that bringing my YouTube audience to whatnot was the second biggest way that I used the competitive advantage of the channel to benefit the resale business. Well, this list right here is what takes the number one spot. And when we launched it back in August, I had a hunch that it would do really well for three reasons. The first one is that our prices are just pretty good. We normally land around 80% of eBay value. For example, Mario Kart Wii. You could normally get 30 bucks or maybe a little bit more for this on eBay. And after fees and everything, you would net maybe 26 or 27, but uh, we pay 25, which is pretty dang close, as long as it's in nice condition. The second reason is that I've been on YouTube for four years now, and over those four years, a whole lot of people, video game vendors especially, have been able to see my character and my values and how I do business with people, so shipping us hundreds or sometimes thousands of dollars worth of stuff at a time just isn't as scary. You know, the idea of the buy list is to try to put reselling video games on easy mode for a lot of people who are kind of serious about it and have access to quality inventory. And the third reason, and I think maybe the most important one, is that most resellers understand the value of time. One of the concepts that we've been touting a ton is the idea of buy low and sell fast. This has been our business model from the very start. And I think a lot of other resellers love the idea of being able to move more product fast without the hassle of having to do photos and listings and then sit on something and wait for it to sell and then pay a bunch of fees on it. Selling stuff all at once and being able to get paid on everything next week is a huge plus for a lot of folks like us. Now, I mentioned to you guys before that November was a record spending month at over 100K. 24K of that went into a single bulk deal, which a lot of you guys probably saw. I posted it recently on Renix P Sale. Another 16 or so went to eBay, just trying to rebuy things that were out of stock with. And the other $60,000 all went to our reseller partners that were selling us stuff through the buy list. And to me, I just think that's so freaking cool and a fantastic validation of the pay your partners philosophy. And it came at the perfect time too, because the other massive change that happened this year is costing a lot of money. Now, if you're a consistent viewer of this channel, you know that for the last few months now, I've been hinting at a big project I've been working on behind the scenes. And if you're still around in this video, however many minutes in, uh, I think you have earned me finally saying publicly that what I'm working on is a video game reseller app. The vision for this app is I want to make it easier for people to check prices on multiple platforms at once, easily add a bunch of games to a lot to make bulk deals and sales easier, 
and also have a digital, more streamlined, more fluid version of our buy list program. Now, you guys know I'm huge on under promising, so I don't wanna get a ton into it right now, but I'm hoping that it comes out in the next couple months or so. But before we fully get into what I'm expecting from 2024, let's go ahead and take a look at how this year's numbers have shaped out so far. So as you can see from 2023, I mean, crazy crazy time and we still have a month left of the year so these are not finalized numbers but we did a little baby 8k on shopify with some integrations that we did 63k on whatnot ebay again is nowhere to be seen because we had to cut that out to do less better 877k so far on amazon absolutely crazy leaving us with 948k in gross sales so far I would estimate that by the end of the year, this number will probably be around 1.1 million. <laughs> We've come a long way from that $500 in the spare room. But that begs the question, okay, again, how much are you actually netting? And that's where we come down to, again, this is a bit of an estimate because we haven't done the taxes, we haven't done all the expenses and everything, but I'm estimating a 15% profit margin for this year based on how like previous months have gone. Now, the question is, is this number a reason for concern? And I honestly would say yes a little bit. I don't really want our net margins to slip much beyond this if I can help it. I think we have a little bit of potential to scale our revenue higher without forcing margins to take more of a hit. But the biggest reason that this dipped again this year is one, having a full-time employee is not cheap, but also because our buy list program, we're shrinking our margins as far as we reasonably can to give our partners the best deal possible. So I expected this to go a little bit lower, but as you can see over the years, this 75, 109, and now 142, which ultimately will probably be more like 150K for the year, is absolutely fantastic. I'm tickled with it. The only reason that this number is a little bittersweet is that this year in particular, it's pretty much all getting reinvested back into developing the reseller app that I told you guys about. So definitely the biggest financial risk I have ever taken. Um, hopefully it pans out, but overall I'm really happy with the direction that our net profits have been going, even though our net margins have been shrinking a bit. Now folks, going forward into 2024, I really only have two goals. The first one is to upload two really quality videos to this channel every single month. I'm gonna be focusing more on business development stuff and I really wanna make some stuff around going and interviewing other people with high level resale businesses to see what I can take away from them because I really wish that that content existed out there. And the second one is just to make one up. By the way, that's the name of the reseller app the best tool possible for the video game resale community. I really love the idea of being able to level up our business and the businesses of the viewers of this channel and our partners at conventions and everything at the same time. And so I'm devoting a lot of time and mental energy to be able to make that as best as I possibly can as an idiot with absolutely no experience. I'm gonna be posting all of the updates for this business and also the app on the second channel if anyone's interested. And I'll go ahead and link the $20,000 video game negotiation video right down here. <sighs> Thanks for sticking with me guys and I will catch you all on the flip.